everyone and welcome to today's wonderful evening with Dr. Ganesh. And uh, yeah, so Dr. Ganesh is a promising uh, orthopedician, a wonderful teacher from Chennai and kind enough to be uh, uh, helping us in this conversational learning uh, experiment. Because a lot of times a didactic learning is very boring and uh, when we get into a conversational mode, it's more easier to learn. So that is a whole idea. So let's make the great beginning. Uh, Dr. Ganesh, uh, uh, can we know a little bit about you? Uh, hello, sir. Thank you for this opportunity. And hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Ganesh. I'm uh, from Chennai. I have finished my MBBS from Stanley Medical College. And uh, I have uh, finished my... DNB Orthopedics from Sundara Medical Foundation, also from Chennai. And uh, just uh, three months back, I've completed my course and uh, just started practicing in this Corona. <laughs> Wonderful. So we have Dr. Kirtu, Dr. Deepak, and uh, many more who are all online joining. So let's make the great beginning. Aristotle and Pluto, once upon a time, used to sit and... Uh, we used to have a discussion like this. So let's yeah. start the rapid fire session. So doctor, among these, uh, which one is a uh, green stick fracture and any comments on it? Yes, sir. See, the, the green stick fracture would be a option C. So any green stick fracture, you see, it's usually very much common in younger, uh, younger people whose uh, epiphysis is not fused. And uh, usually this occurs uh, with a break in one cortex and the other cortex is not broken. When you are right. applying a bending right. force, like a bending force to the bone, only one side of the cortex breaks, the other side remains intact. This is called as a green stick fracture. Wonderful. So we have a compression fracture in the spine. We have a pathological fracture in the people who have underlying malignancy with metastasis. And this is the green stick and this is called the torus fracture is what we need to remember. Now, Doctor, between these two, which attitude possibly is anterior dislocation of the hip? So the, there are two most common types of dislocation, anterior and posterior. Posterior is the most common type, sir. So the anterior would be a flexion, abduction, and external rotation deformity. We call it as a Faber. F-A-B-E-R, Faber. And the posterior dislocation would be flexion, adduction, Internal rotation, which is called as FADIR, F-A-D-I-R. So here the C would be a anterior dislocation and the D would be posterior dislocation. Excellent. So the, there are certain deformities that we need to remember. The dinner folk deformity, as all of you know, and the swan leg deformity. This can be an image-based question in the entrance, which is quite common in the people who have conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. And anterior dislocation of the hip and the posterior dislocation of the hip. Now, doctor, I'm going to shoot one uh, quick quiz for you. Uh, there okay. are certain classical deformities. And uh, I want you to quickly tell me what is the places where you see this? Where do you see Rhinek? So Rhinek is called as a torticolis, sir. Uh, usually the children will uh, present with a postural torticollis. That is a postural. They usually see a TV at an angle or play at an, a certain angle of the video games. So they develop a postural torticollis. That is most common in children. Whereas in adults, if you see the muscular torticollis would be most common. And uh, it is also seen in cervical spine injuries. And uh, there is one syndrome associated with it. It is called as Klippel fail syndrome. And uh, one more thing is, uh, in case of a Parkinson's patient, Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, in Parkinson's patient, those who are having the dopaminergic treatment, they will develop a cervical uh, dystonia. In those cases also, the muscles will go into rigidity and uh, torticolis will occur in the, those patients also. Wonderful, wonderful, doctor. So where do we see drooping of shoulder? So the drooping of shoulder is mostly seen with the clavicle fracture. And... Uh, right. uh, so the, that is the most common thing, sir. But it's also you can uh, see in the spine abnormalities like scoliosis and kyphosis as a as a you know structural deformity compensatory mechanism. 
like a hip pathology knee pathology ankle pathology in wherever there is a limb shortening or a trunkal abnormality we can see the shoulder also droops oh now where do we see flat shoulder doctor so the the flat shoulder is most commonly seen in anterior dislocation of shoulder sir and uh, the flat shoulder is uh, it means that the contour of the deltoid muscle is lost so it can either it, it may be due to anterior dislocation of shoulder or sometimes due to the brachial plexus injury or axillary nerve injury the deltoid muscle get wasted so that time there will be a no support for the shoulder and it automatically dislocates also in case of rotator cuff injury there is no movement with the shoulder will difficult so they will not move leading to a muscle wastage that also leads to a flat shoulder but most common would be a anterior dislocation of shoulder wonderful then where do we get the yes shaped deformity of the humerus doctor the s shaped deformity is also called as a gunstock deformity sir it is most commonly seen with the supracondylar humerus fracture uh, it is most commonly seen in children there are two types of uh, supracondylar fractures are there one would be the extension type the other would be the flexion type the extension extension type is the most common that is the gunstock or s shaped deformity sir wonderful and where do we see dinner fork deformity and uh, in the folk everybody must be knowing it's uh, commonly seen in the colis fracture which is the extra articular distal radius fracture with the extension of the distal fragment wonderful though. and where the opposite, we see opposite uh, uh, one more point if i add the opposite to the dinner folk would be the garden spade deformity garden spade deformity which is seen in smith's fracture exactly oh, opposite to the colis what is called uh, what's that no opposite of colis is called what deformity smith s m i t h smith fracture smith fracture okay yeah you can see the garden spade it's a, exactly opposite to dinner folk the dinner folk will be having the posteriorly it will have this bend whereas the garden spade will have a anteriorly it will have the bend like this so it's exactly okay. opposite great and where do we see boutonniere deformity doctor so the boutonniere deformity is uh, very much uh, common in rheumatoid arthritis sir also uh, this uh, uh, schwann neck deformity and rheumatoid i mean and the boutonniere deformity both these are very common in rheumatoid arthritis there is a subtle difference between these two the boutonniere deformity is due to the rupture of the central slip of the uh, extensor extensor digit which means that uh, the uh, proximal interphalangeal joint will go into flexion whereas the distal interphalangeal joint will go into the extension it means it forms a u see the the proximal interphalangeal joint it goes to flexion whereas the distal interphalangeal joint it goes to the extension so it forms like a u shape so boutonniere it has a u u in it so you can remember it like that boutonniere wow. u wow. means like a u shape flexion of the pap and extension of the dap the exact opposite of that would be the schwann neck deformity okay so swan neck is opposite to the boutonniere yes there it would be the extension of the uh, pap and flexion of the dap exactly opposite wonderful doctor so dip will be flexion and pap will be extension that would be the swan neck deformity which is opposite of boutonniere deformity um, and um, really it is a uh it's a great mnemonic that you have mentioned you yeah. uh, remember you and all the problems are solved you know so, that is yes, where neat pg neat pg toppers are uh, uh, smart enough to devise the mnemonics which are required to be remembered wonderful doctor wonderful and Thank what you. is mallet finger doctor so the this is uh, the mallet finger and the next one jersey finger sir these two are different from the boutner and swan neck in boutonniere and swan neck uh, two or three joints will be involved sir whereas in the mallet and jersey finger only one joint is involved that is only the dip joint wow. okay so if the, if the G, dip joint is in flexion that means the extensor is gone that is the mallet finger okay. exactly opposite okay. to that would be the jersey finger in here the fdp flexor digitorum profundus that will be gone so the extra, the dip will be in extension great so dip being in extension and flexor digitorum profundus is gone right 
So that is yeah, Jersey that is, finger. Uh, that is, it's uh, also called as uh, rugby finger, sir. It's also called rugby. Rugby in rugby players they used to catch the ball in rugby. I see. So the rugby. ball, the ball rugby. will hit the finger like this, and it will get torn. The FDP will get ruptured. So it's also called as a rugby finger. Wonderful. So Jersey finger, rugby finger, and uh, the flexor digitorum profundus. And the dip going into extension. That is the buzzwords to be remembered about the Jersey finger. Excellent, doctor. So, listening to you is uh, more like a Kaveri or uh, the knowledge of G G Ganga flowing. So, uh, I'm uh, very happy that uh, instead of one, one teacher comes and then keeps on talking, we get bored. Always yeah. conversational will make um, us to learn in true sense. And that too. By a neat PG, once upon a time topper, and uh, who knows the tricks of the modern students. We are all yes. two decades old teachers. So um, we lost, we still have some charm, but not as charming as a, a newer generation teacher. So I'm very but happy. Old, to see old, you. Uh, oh, old is always gold, sir. <laughs> old is always gold, sir. Uh, yeah. <laughs> even, even with ankylosis of the neck. <laughs> So, I'm very happy to see Vinno Vinay um, and uh, Deepak and many more. Vinno is going to become our topper shortly and going to join a 10 p.m. Neat PG fight show with Dr. Murli Bharadwaj one day. I'm very sure about it. Yes? Congratulations. Right. So, uh, good doctor. So, Vinay is cervical spine injury. Boutonier Bout deformity is a central extensor slip of the finger. Mallet finger is the distal end of the uh, index extensor and the jersey finger is the rupture of the distal end of the flexor digitorum profundus of the index finger is the carry form message. Now continuing our journey, so where do we see yeah. other deformities sir? flexion, adduction, interlocution? So it is mostly seen in the posterior dislocation as we have already mentioned sir and uh, it's also common in the uh, that acetabular labral tears. The oh. acetabulum labrum, the acetabulum labrum, it gets torn, and depending upon wherever it gets stuck between the hip, uh, between the femur head and the acetabulum, uh, based on that, the impingement uh, will have different types of deformity. Wonderful. So that's also a cause for the flexion. So flexion, flexion. abduction, that's a Faber deformity. That's a very well we can see in the anterior dislocation of the hip, sir. And also in the neck of femur fracture, intertrochantic fracture, intertrochantic femur fracture, in all these cases, we can see the similar type of pattern, but there is some differences uh, in between them. Great. Classically, the paper deformity is seen in anterior dislocation of hip. Yeah. Wonderful. And incomplete external and complete external rotation of lower limb. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. The, in the neck of femur fracture, especially in the intracapsular uh, fracture, sir. That means the, the uh, basic cervical would be a, it could be either intracapsular or extracapsular type. The basic cervical, that means the neck and the trochanter junction region. So that could be going either into a complete or incomplete fracture. I mean, I mean, complete or incomplete external rotation deformity. But whereas the intracapsular neck of femur fracture will always go for an incomplete external rotation deformity of the lower limb. Whereas the complete uh, will be intertrochantric fractures, sir. Okay, complete external yeah, intertrochantric and uh, in of femur. yes, and uh, neck of the femur uh, intracapsular fracture will be incomplete external rotation, right, yeah. doctor? And remember, sir, intracapsular incomplete. Wonderful. So intracapsular oh. incomplete. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Intracapsular is incomplete external rotation. Incomplete. So whatever comes extra capsular, that will be a complete external rotation. That is the thing, sir. Wonderful. So let us say, oh, I'm sorry. Um, sometimes when the hand hits the... Uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, difficult. <laughs> it will run. Okay. Now, um, so doctor, let me first uh, understand. Uh, this is the head, right? Then yes, we sir. have the neck. Then, neck uh, yeah. um, then we have the shaft, and uh, somewhere we have one greater trochanter and uh, 
yes, lesser potential. Am I right, doctor? Yes, sir. Correct, sir. Yes, sir. So, till what extent we call it as intracapsular, doctor? The the capsule usually attaches uh, in the anterior aspect in the intertrochanter line, sir. Between the between. Oh. In between the lesser trochanter and the greater trochanter, just uh, our line will be there. Up to that, okay. there will be a capsule. I see. Whereas in the okay. posterior aspect, two centimeter above that, the capsule ends. It's a little shorter in the posterior aspect than the anterior. I see. So posterior part of the capsule is uh, uh, shorter and anterior is longer, right, doctor? Yes, yes, yes. A little longer. Anterior will be a little longer. Yeah. Very good. So, so in uh, Tomorrow's exam, we need to remember that whenever it is intracapsular, it will be incomplete axial rotation. Whenever it is intertrochanteric, then uh, and below, and and below sir. Yeah, intertrochanteric and below. Sha either the shaft mm -hmm. could be shaft, it could be the greater trochanter, whatever. Below, whatever below comes, it will be a complete external rotation. Complete external rotation of the lower limb. Wonderful, doctor. Wonderful. I never. I never, uh, I always used to get confused about this intercapsular okay. and trochanteric uh, while preparing for entrance days. Uh, but of course, uh, no, we just uh, remember that we have to remember the anatomy, sir, the head, uh, the neck, uh, and up to the capsule, wherever wherever it may be, it will be an incomplete fracture, incomplete uh, reactional rotation. So uh, the, uh, we can uh, correlate, sir. It's very easy to remember. That's what. Wonderful. So intracapsular. Intra is incomplete and trochanteric and below intertrochanteric is all complete. Wonderful. Yes. Now, doctor, what are the five P's for the impending vascular damage in musculoskeletal trauma? Oh, the, it is mostly we can see in the compartment syndrome, sir. Compartment syndrome or in a crush injury, wherever the uh, blood vessel, uh, blood supply is cut off, there are five P's. Actually, we can add one more P also. Uh, the five P's most commonly said are the pain, then pallor, paresthesia, pulselessness, and paralysis. Pain, pallor, paresthesia, pulselessness, pulselessness, no pulse, no pulse. Ah, pulselessness, and pulselessness, and finally, paralysis. Correct. So these are the symptoms and signs of the compartment syndrome. The last P would be a compartment pressure. Pressure. Oh. We pressure. can add one more P also there. Pressure. So wow. the normal here, the pain, pallor, and all, uh, there will be very sensitive markers there. Pain, pallor, paresthesia, and paralysis. Except for this pulselessness. So sometimes in a compartment syndrome, uh, that uh, pulselessness will be a very late presentation. So based on that, we cannot uh, decide whether it is an acute compartment syndrome or what. So the, comp the compartment would have been uh, progressed to a further great extent, but still the pulse may be present. So the pulselessness would be the pulselessness would be the last indicator. Oh, so last always in doubt, we have to measure the intracompartmental pressure. So the normal pressure would be zero to eight mmHg. Normal would be 0 to 8 mmHg. Any pressure more than 30, 30, would be a considered as a compartment syndrome. That is the pressure in which the uh, arteries will collapse. The arteries will get completely compressed and no blood flow will be there. That will be more than 30 mmHg. That is the pressure. So after more than 30 mmHg, it is an emergency indication for surgery. Fasciotomy and release the compartment. Great. Now, uh, in the fracture management, what are the absolute indications where you prefer to do the uh, uh, open reduction? Open reduction. That's right. So in any if any fracture, we have to decide whether uh, we have to do open reduction or closed reduction. That means it means uh, there is a dislocation is there. So once a dislocation is there, uh, but we cannot uh, no, uh, reduce the fracture uh, by a closed means. That is the most, uh, most important uh, indication, sir. Failure of Close reduction. Right. Failure. If you are unable to close reduction. If you are unable to close reduction, uh, no further tries. Uh, you can directly open it. That is very important. You can give a few tries, but if it's not coming, immediately we have to go for open. That is the single most important indication of the open reduction. The next just like, important uh, indication. Just like absolute indication for divorce is failure of marriage. Marriage. Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. 
so the next would be a uh, joint fracture that is a intra articular fractures especially if they are very much displaced so we cannot uh, by closed means we cannot reduce the fragments because the intra articular fractures will need a uh, absolute absolute uh, reduction there is, should be no step not even 1 mm 2 mm is acceptable so in those cases we need to be uh, compulsory we have to open and reduce the fractures then the salter harris classification that will be a epiphyseal injuries for the children in them the third and fourth type which means the if the fracture is going through the epiphysis or through the epiphysis and metaphysis both so the type 3 would be a through the epiphysis if a fracture line going through the epiphysis the type 4 would be a fracture line going through both epiphysis and metaphysis in both those cases we have to compulsorily open reduce because epiphyseal injury if we leave it alone it will lead to bone abnormalities one side will grow go good the other fracture side will not grow and there will be a limb abnormalities will be there so absolute indication for open reduction the next would be a major avulsion fractures the avulsion fracture that, uh, for example uh, acl ligament is uh, attached to the tibial condyle inside the knee if the ligament gets avulsed then the knee stability will be gone the bones will rub against each other there will be it's a, if we cannot closely closely we cannot reduce it so those conditions of the major avulsion fracture we have to open and reduce it and in case of non union we might need to put a bone graft so definitely non union non union means more than 9 months there is no union no, no signs of any fracture union that is called as non union we have to put a bone graft for those cases so there are the two definition for non union that means more than 9 months if there is no signs of any union or for the three consecutive months there is no no improvement in the union that is the that means the callus is formed but it is not improving in the further consecutive months so in both these cases could be considered as a non union and the replantation of extremities of, of course if the limb gets uh, you know sawed off in a road traffic accident if amputated they will carry the limb in ice box and all the, those things and all we have to open and then only we have to reattach the finger digits and, or limbs and all so all these things are absolute indications for open direction and don't compromise uh, these in the, these conditions we should not compromise that we are doing a minimal invasive procedures and all no compromise we have to open the use correct So, in the close reduction, displaced intra-articular fracture, type three and four epiphyseal injury, major avulsion fracture, and non-union, which is defined by more than uh, nine months not having a union or three consecutive months. Wonderful. So that's a great um, um, a learning. And why non-union? Because we need to put a bone graft. Wonderful. Yeah, we need to graft it. Yeah. Any comments on the relative indications? Yes, sir. Uh, the relative would be uh, uh, generally the uh, less less problems than the previous one. We have seen the absolute indications. They are non-union. If we are going to reduce, um, do open here uh, in the relative, we can do a delayed union, which means that there is a consecutive months there is union is happening, but not a complete union has occurred. So that will be a delayed union. It will take more than six months to at least unite. So that is a delayed or multiple fractures. If there is a at the initial time by close reduction, if you are able to get a good reduction, but uh, uh, in the subsequent uh, serial X-ray we will repeat it after one week or after two weeks. At those time, if there is a loss of reduction, that time we cannot again go and reduce because already a week has passed. So that time we have to open and reduce the fracture. And the pathological fracture, which means that there is any tumor or any cystic lesion or some lesion in the bone following which a fracture would have occurred. Most common pathological fracture would be an infection tumor. the bone would have had osteomyelitis and bone is already weak or uh, there is a tumor in the bone it is already weak so it will get fractured there Th those conditions we have to open reduce especially to get a biopsy to determine the so those those there uh, uh, the open reduction is preferred then uh, that's what for better nursing care all these are uh, relative conditions uh, better nursing care bed rest all these things are, are relative conditions for the open reduction so the doubtful would be a neurovascular injuries and some open fractures like in a gastillo anderson classification type 1 it may be uh, 1 cm of wound only very small and if the wound is not much contaminated if the wound is very clean in those fractures it's we still debate uh, we can do a close a close reduction also we can do in type 2 the size would be 2 to 10 cm of the uh, open wound in those cases we, it's debatable we can do either open or uh, we can also uh, do closed so it's a uh, debatable conditions cosmetic reasons economic all these are debatable so whether we can do closed or open it depends upon the surgeon and all uh, the neurovascular injury is a very important point there sir uh, some neurovascular injuries we will uh, leave leave off 
for example like a supra supra condylar fracture of the humerus uh, there are two conditions pink hand pink pulseless hand and pink pulse full hand two conditions are there in those conditions only if the pulse is adequate even if there is a neurovascular inju neuro neurological injury suspected he can live for 6 weeks time it could be either neuropraxia just a conduction block it would automatically recover there is no need for an urgent uh, surgical procedure to open it to trace the course of the nerve all these things are not necessary so uh, these condition is questionable it depends on surgeon we can either explore on the same time or we can leave for 6 weeks after that uh, if the nerve is recovering then no need for opening still it is not recovering then it might be a real nerve damage then we have to open it either do a nerve graft or a nerve repair or whatever uh, depending upon the condition absolutely that's wonderful doctor now what is this web do we use because one of the favorite questions image based mcqs uh, quite yes, often come in the mid pg especially from the dynos orthopedics um uh, x-rays in, uh, in the, i mean the instruments here similarly in surgery and also x-rays in radiology so typically around 50 mcqs come which are image based in the tumor or snp pg so that is the reason yes. looking at it we should know how to smell it and uh, sniff it and make a diagnosis so what is this uh, doctor basically so this is called as a k wire or krishner wire that's the inventor's name krishner is called as k wire so how we have to identify it is the this is the least you know so thin uh, instrument in orthopedics we use plates nails screws rods and all so the very uh, it is available in even 0.5 1 cm 0.5 cm so very very thin uh, and it will be available in different sizes from 0.5 to 0.51 1.5 2 up to 3 cm it could be available so you can see the picture there very less diameter different types of diameters of the pins are there so Great. by this sure. it could be easily identified as k wire and there is no segmentations uh, there's no segmentation in the wire it will be very completely plain wire there's no threads uh, there's no threads would be there it's very plain completely plain wire and very thin we can easily see so by this we can find it there is a k wire yeah one is most so commonly used in yeah go on sir go yes. on. so the k wires are most commonly used in uh, uh, two important things one would be the where the growth plate is involved in children if the growth plate is uh, not not it completely fused that is the epiphyseal injuries in those cases if we cannot pass a screw through there if we pass a screw will damage the screw threads will damage the epiphyseal plate so that will impair the growth of the child so in those cases the k wire the, it has no threads and very thin so we can pass two criss crossing wires so that the fracture will be stable we'll put a plaster cast in them and uh, it will automatically heal so in the children in the with epiphyseal fractures we can use it also in the hands and uh, foot foot and toes small small bones we cannot use large pins it will uh, rupture the bone so very thin wires like k wires uh, 0.1 1 mm 2 mm these wires can be used in the hand and foot bones and another important thing even in large bones like uh, distal radius or ankle fractures it is very difficult to obtain a reduction in the fracture we can reduce the fracture we can hold it put a k wire and maintain the reduction until the final screw is uh, placed so for maintaining reduction also we can use the k wires correct so to maintain the reduction and in the small bones and wherever the growth plate is involved that is epiphyseal injuries we use the yes. k wire and k wire one wonderful point it is plain not segmented and uh, different diameters 0.51 and uh, 1.5 cm is available so once more revising what all that we have uh, discussed earlier so what is this uh, deformity doctor so this is the torticollis or the rhine neck deformity so this is mostly uh, in this uh, we can see that uh, sternocleidal muscle uh, muscle will be contracted there so that's the picture there so that contraction will lead to the head will be tilted to one side and the chin is to do towards the opposite side that is the important thing sir head tilt towards the same side and chin would be opposite side opposite so this is the classical as a if the right side is Which contracted here sir chin or head no in this picture the right side is contracted right side sternocleidal muscle is contracted i see okay this so one. whichever side it is contracted that side the head will tilt and chin will be opposite 
right so sometimes <laughs> And we prepare everything and suddenly examiner asks an unexpected question. <laughs> so, yeah. yes. Yeah. What no, is this? Yeah. This is the drooping, uh, shoulder drooping, sir. So, usually right. seen in the clavicle fracture. You can see the redness around the shoulder. The left shoulder here is drooped. The right. left shoulder is drooping and you can see the redness around the, the, the clavicle. It's uh, fractured. So, it, it's drooping. That's right. So... Then what is this and where do we see, sir? So this condition, uh, this is the, called as a skin. You can see the tent, it's a, like tenting, tent-like structure there. But the, can you see, sir, the, it's a, like a tent-like structure. But the, there is no skin break, uh, there's no break in the skin there. So it is a commonly seen in very uh, clavicle fracture. But based upon the appearance of the tenting of the skin, if there is skin tenting, that means the fracture uh, between two fractures, the skin will get stuck in between the two fragments. If it is stuck there, the, there will be a small uh, depression in the skin. In that condition, we have to do a uh, open direction. That means the skin is stuck inside. If there is no problem with there at all, we can uh, treat with the closed direction also. Oh, but here, uh, there, seems to be, there seems to be there is no break in the skin. And I don't, uh, I cannot see whether the, there is a, any a dip in the skin also. I see. This is something like a malunion in case of fractured clavicle, doctor. Yeah, this could be this could be either malunion or a very displaced uh, acute fracture. We have to I see, see the X-ray to arrive at a final diagnosis. Sir. Great. But this 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 uh, calls us for looking at an open reduction as an option, right? No, no, sir. That's what when when we see a tenting of the skin, we have to see if there is a break in the skin. That means the skin gets punctured by the fact that we have to see. If that is there, open direction. Or okay. the skin will get stuck between the two fracture fragments, but it's not broken. We can see it uh, like a depression in the skin. There's a depression in the skin we can see, but there's no break. That also we need to do open direction. But here there is no depression I can see and there is no skin break also. So here we can do a very close reduction. If the, but we have to see the X-ray. If it is more displaced, we have to do open. Otherwise, we can uh, uh, just uh, just with the closed, uh, I mean, uh, uh, non, I mean, by a conservative manager also we can treat it off. Great. Based upon Correct. the X-ray, we have to final. Uh, so, so this is the case of ma mal union death. So, with the X-ray, we can see here there is some uh, some growth of the callus is uh, visible. So, it could be a mal united shoulder. So, Great. the common Great. complication should be a drooping of shoulder. The clavicle, uh, the length will become very short and the shoulder will become very short here. The uh, cosmetic appearance will be a problem. Sometimes the clavicle, the one fragment will be rotated. Instead of like this, it will be rotated. And that will cause a short, uh, still further difficulty in moving the shoulders. So all these are complications of the clavicle mal union. Wonderful, doctor. And uh, once more, this is... So this would be the clavicle fracture here. Um, hello. This, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And this also a case of. Uh, uh, this, way, this is also a case of. Uh, there's a drooping of your shoulders also there. Yeah. Yes. So what is the Alderman need classification of this below fracture, doctor? So, uh, actually, it's got uh, Alderman's uh, knee, uh, knee classification, sir. Uh, a double L M N Alderman's uh, classification. So he is the. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. The Alman is the pioneer of the classification. With the near, uh, he has modified the classification. So there are three types of classification over there. Uh, the group one, group two, group three. Group one will be the middle shaft. That is the most common uh, fracture. Uh, around eighty percent of the clavicle will be a mid shaft of the fractures. Approximately eighty percent, and uh, most of them would be treated by a conservative management, sir. If there is a hundred percent displacement of the fracture, then only we go for an operative fracture. I mean, operative management. The 100% means uh, the fracture, if it is like this, okay. Completely, it's displaced. Even if there is a small overlap between both the fragments, we can try for a uh, non-operative non method. But if there is no connection between both the fragments, it is up, up and one, one is up, one is down. That means more than 100% dislocation, the displacement, I mean. That is the condition we have to operate it. That is a group one. That is the most common uh, type of injury. Then group two would be the lateral third. That is near the acromaclavicular injuries there. That uh, if it is rotated, the AC joint, if it is injured or the acromaclavicular ligaments are injured, 
in all these condition we have to open open uh, and reduce the fracture and uh, fix it otherwise we can just manage by conservative management then the group 3 would be a very rare form of clavicle uh, injuries that is a medial one third near the sternum so if that is injured or whatever uh, even if it is fractured uh, unless there is a complication of uh, subclavian vein vessels are there in the underneath behind the medial part of clavicle only the subclavian vessels brachial uh, i mean uh, brachial uh, brachial plexus everything pass through just behind the medial aspect of the clavicle so that is a very grave complication with the medial uh, third of the fracture clav uh, uh, clavicles so in the, that case we have to promptly evaluate the neurovascular status and all if there is any issues we have to open open and uh, operate if there is no problem we can manage with the conservative management also wonderful doctor so Group one is middle third eighty percent, and if they are displaced, uh, the operative uh, open reduction uh, and operative management is needed, and there the non-union rate is uh, typically higher, and typically uh, less than around five percent, yeah. Uh, and non-displaced is uh, non-operative management is manageable. So this is an example of uh, displaced, and this is an example of a non-displaced. Uh, uh, clavicular fracture. Wonderful. So, what is this view of the X-ray, and where do we take this film, doctor? So, this is called as a cephalate view, sir. Otherwise, called Zanka view. So, normally, uh, the AP AP shoulder we are taking uh, with the uh, anterior projection of the X-ray beam towards us. If there is a 15 degree tilt in the cephalic direction, so see here we can see 10 to 15 degree in a cephalic direction. If you are uh, focusing the beam, uh, here we can see the uh, the fracture fragments can be easily seen, which is displaced high, which is moved higher up, which is moved lower up, can be very easily seen. Wonderful. So, 15 degrees cephalic tilt with a Jankus view to determine the superior and inferior displacement of the fracture clavicle yeah. is the point. Now, for the operative management of clavicle fracture, what are the absolute versus Relative contrain, uh, I mean, the indications. Uh, the non-operative non causes would be a minimal displacement, sir. That is less than 100% displacement. Those fractures can be non-operative. And uh, there is a, the clavicle, uh, if there is shortening, uh, the displacement is measured by superior and inferior like this, upward and downward. Whereas shortening is measured like overlapping of the fragments. If there is too much overlap here, um, there is a, uh, less than 2 centimeter overlap is there, we can manage by conservative. And if there is no vascular injury, there is no brachial plexus, no injury, nothing is there, then all these three conditions are mainly for non-operative, sir. First would be a minimal displacement, then a shortening is less than 2 cm, no neurovascular deficit. So these three would be a, uh, for non-operative. Yes. The other condition yes. would be operative management. As I said, it's an open fracture. If there is a break in the skin or there is a skin tenting, you can see there, the skin is stuck in between the fragments. Yeah, uh, th th those conditions, or there's an artery injury or vein injury, and and one, one more important condition should be a floating shoulder. So a floating shoulder means we'll have a clavicle fracture along with the glenoid fracture also. So which means the shoulder basically floats around. There is no support. So the clavicle support is also cut off, and the glenoid scapula support is also cut off, and the entire upper limb just floats around. So that's called as floating shoulder. In those cases, we have to compulsorily fix the clavicle. We can either uh, fix the, the clean or can be left also based upon uh, if, uh, how the fracture is there. We can either operate that or uh, leave it off, but the clavicle must be com uh, compulsorily, it should be operated in a floating. That is a very important condition. Then non union, mal union, especially symptomatic, that is important. Even asymptomatic non union, mal union also can be left conservatively. Only the symptomatic patient should be operated as far as clavicle is concerned. And then unstable fracture patterns. That's what the type two, type two A to B. The, the these two, these type two A to B and all will be a sub sub classification of the knees. That be a two depth, in depth, very depth. Sir. That and all. Uh, just uh, just uh, we have to remember that unstable fracture pattern should be enough. Right. So That's unstable right. fracture pattern that would be enough. So what is this, and where do we see this, uh, doctor? So here, the, this is a flattening of shoulder, uh, right side of the shoulder. Uh, most commonly with the anterior dislocation of shoulder. You can see uh, in the left side, the deltoid contour is maintained there. Whereas in the right side, you can see the clavicle distal end is very uh, prominent. That means the deltoid muscle is uh, pulled away, which means the shoulder is moved, joint is dislocated. That's called as in X-ray, it's called as empty glenoid sign. So what is that, doctor? 
in if we take x ray the glenoid glenoid will be empty so it's called as empty glenoid sign empt empty empty glenoid sign wonderful glenoid sign most common in shoulder anterior shoulder dislocation yeah great now what is this and where do we see this so this is the s shape deformity that we are we are discussing see the s shape the gun stock if you see a barrel gun like uh, in a in a old movies the cowboy movies and all we see the whole uh, big shotgun with both hands so that the appearance will be like this so the elbow it is a extension type of supracondylar fracture That's so right. the two types That's i said right. so the classification is called gartland classification that uh, i have seen some mcq questions regarding that d a r t l a n d gartland classification great just uh, great. just remember the name of the classification that would be enough right so s shape deformity then dimple sign because of one of the spikes of the proximal fragment penetrates the muscle and tethering of the skin is seen and soft spots there are the effusion beneath the anchorous muscle so these are the classical features now what is this classical deformity doctor uh, even the online, the online students um can keep uh, uh, typing the answers so that will uh, uh, that will make it a truly interactive uh, uh, session you know before we join go to medical college we used to ask a lot of questions in physics chemistry the moment we join the medical college our first teacher is anatomy no offense taken for a top ranker in neat ug exam the last ranker in the neat pg become the teacher it is called albuminocytologic dissociation so uh, between us both so that will be a real culture shock oh my god an ambitious top ranker student will get a um, uh, of course there are some great anatomy teachers no doubt about it so uh, so after joining medical college we start the habit of uh, asking questions because if we ask questions suddenly everyone will start uh, you know there is a very famous saying we are otherwise brilliant but for our seniors we are otherwise brilliant but for our seniors because if you want to read really uh, guidance physiology the seniors will tell there is no need of reading guidance physiology then you will ask what is the book that i want to, that i can read oh you can read old question papers notes oh i see then another senior will come and say that notes itself is 100 pages so i have written a notes on the notes of the old question papers so you only need 10 pages to pass the exam so that's how we stop asking questions so that is the reason uh, doctor this conversational learning is a uh, um uh, something i want all of you to be proactively punching your points that you are reading it's like all of us meeting every day evening at 10 pm along with one of the neat pg uh, topper who is our celebrity teacher uh, joining us and uh, that way spardhaya vardhate vidya every day we are uh, having some sort of a discussion together so that we are more motivated really really um, uh, doctor please don't consider that i'm flattering you but you are like <laughs> epitome of knowledge epitome of knowledge you know you are like a you. flowing ganges and uh, we are uh, all our ignorance is being washed out and uh, i love to once more become a student if i get a teacher like you so thank you once more yeah. for uh, uh, being yeah. part of this and uh, we have another 10 minutes uh, before we finish as many questions as we can that's great So, what is this? And where do you see that? We'll run a quick uh, picture show. Yeah. Sure, sure. This is the bowden deformity, sir. Already we've explained it. Rupture of the central extensor tendon. Great. And this is. So this would be the the mallet finger. That's also we have explained. Only the distal end of the index finger, that is the finger, the distal end of the extensor slip is ruptured. So leading to only flexion deformity of the DIP. Great. And uh, where do we see this? so this is the jersey finger or the mallet finger here the patient is unable to flex the dap you can see he can flex the other dap's but only the ring finger is not able to flex the dap so it is kept in extended position due to fdp rupture great 
then um, uh, so it is the FTP evolution that's very important to remember. And this yes, is called as and they can also add on point zone one injury. Zone one injury. That's a there are five zones in the palm, five zones and eight zones in the dorsum. Just uh, for the namesake, five zones in the palm and eight zones in the dorsum. In the palm, five zones that is very important. There's zone one, it is a uh, FDP injury. Zone two, it is called as a danger zone. That's an important MCQ. Zone two is called as danger zone. Zone four is called as enemy zone. Zone four would be a the flexor retina, retina column region here, carpal tunnel. That region would be a zone four that is called as enemy region. We will want our enemies to get dam damaged there. So it's called as enemy region there. So just a MCQ pointer, sir. Yeah. Right. Wonderful. So this is um, uh, uh, this is the fatty deformity, posterior dislocation of the hip. So this is flexion. This is adduction. Flexion, adduction, and internally rotated. The so rotation we can say by petala. You can see the petala there. Petala is uh, facing medially. It means it, the, the limb is internally rotated. Great. Then uh, what is this, doctor? Well, this is the opposite of that. Flexion, abduction, and external rotation seen in anterior dislocation of the hip. Great. You see there, the petal is not completely facing outside. So it's only partially and also the foot, the lateral border of the foot is not completely touching the cart. So it means it's a incompletely external rotated. So it is seen in the neck of femur, that is intracapsular. Whatever happens in intracapsular, we see incomplete in uh, incomplete uh, external rotation. Wonderful, doctor. So incomplete external rotation of the lower limb, fracture neck of femur. Great. And what is this? So this factor? Is the, that's what the lateral border of foot is completely touching the cot. So it is a complete external rotation. So which means all the fractures below the capsule, trochanteric, intertrochanteric, shaft of femur, all these fractures will have this type of uh, appearance. The limb is short. The limb is also short. We can see it by the heel, heel position. Oh, this heel is at a higher level compared to this heel. So this yes, is sir. how we identify the shortening, right, Dr. Shortening. Yes, sir. That is how we are uh, shortening will be identified. Yes. Great. Uh, what is the diagnosis and uh, where do we use this, uh, these things? Oh, uh, this is the pediatric bone. We can see the epiphysis is still not fused. So uh, a screw is used in the epiphysial region, which means probably it could be a avulsion of the fra fra fracture avulsion. It could be a, a, some ligament injury which will avulse the fracture fragment. And if there is a large fracture fragment, it should be fixed to prevent the bone uh, deformity. One, otherwise, one, for one part of the bone will grow well, the other will not grow uh, properly. It lead to bone deformity, either genu varum or valgum. So we have to fix that fracture. So this is the arthroscopically, uh, they would have done it. Uh, through a keyhole, arthroscopically, they would have used a uh, screw to fix the uh, fragment. Probably avulsion of the some fracture would be there. Great. So uh, arthroscopic fixation with the candulated screws for the evolution fracture of the tibial spine in the case of the children. Yeah. So what is this instrument, doctor, and where is it used? Oh, first we have to see whether it is a tibia nail or a femur nail. This is a obviously nail. Everybody will know whether it is a tibial nail or femur nail. We have to first identify. You can see there is a bend in the proximal aspect. There is a bend here. This is called as Herzog bend. H E R Z O G. Yes, E R H H H H sir. H E R Z O G. Herzog. Z O G. Z Z O G. H E R. Her. Her. Zog. Z O G. D. No. H E R Z Z Z O G. Herzog. Herzog bend. It's eleven degrees, sir. It is 11, 11 degrees. So this is only present in the tibial nail. To accommodate right. that, the tibial slope, it, to accommodate it, there is a bend of 11 degree in the, in the descent in the nails. So this is called tibial nail, Herzog bend of 11 degree. I have seen some MCQs regarding this Herzog bend also. That's why I wanted to mention that. Right. So, so this is how we have to identify whether it's a tibia or femoral nail. That's the thing. Wonderful. So you mean to say the femoral in the in the case of the femur, 
when we use uh, intermetal nail it will not have a bend no it will have the bend sir but it will be a complete uh, not like a acute bend here the entire uh, the entire nail will be anteriorly bent because the femur is anteriorly bowed so to accommodate right. the anterior bowing of the femur the nail is uh, the entire nail will be slightly anteriorly bowed here there is a acute bend in the proximal aspect one acute bend is there and relatively the rest of the nail is very straight so that is the herzog bend and it's a tibial nail if there is a bow is very uniformly it comes not like acute like angle like this only that is a femoral nail to accommodate the anterior bowing of the femur that's a normal anatomical uh, structure one so what is this and where is it used doctor so this is the proximal tibial uh, plate sir the distal tibial plate also will be a similar appearance but uh, the bend the four holes are there in the aspect upper, uh, uh, upper aspect the bend is uh, it will be bent and lightly rotated so and uh, whereas in the distal aspect we use a one a one more plate called a hockey stick plate like it will be like a hockey hockey bat Oh, same thing so, that is called a hockey stick plate that is used in distal femur distal uh, tibia whereas this is used in the proximal tibia wow so uh, so these are the plates and screws great now what is this and where we use it doctor so this is what i was saying this is a femoral nail you can see there is no no clear bend you can see the entire nail is slightly bent correct You can see the the entire nail is slightly bent. There is no sharp bend in the one only one aspect. So this is a oh. femoral nail. This is usually used in the shaft of the femur to be either comminuted or uh, displaced, undisplaced, whatever. But only in the shaft we can easily, if you are able to reduce, we can put a nail inside. So it acts as an internal fixator. It's a load bearing device. Whereas the plate would be a load sharing device. So what is our body weight? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. For so generally, for how long will you retain this uh, nail, doctor? In the old times, uh, some ten, fifteen years back, only stainless steel uh, nails will be available. Sir. But now, titan nails are available. So that could be left as a li lifelong also. Oh, the only one is we will give a certi we will give a certificate so that they can travel in an airplane safely. <laughs> Otherwise, in checking, they will be stuck. Oh, it's like a souvenir bullet. Yeah, <laughs> like right. you can keep it as a lifelong, uh, no, no issues. So, what is this, and uh, where is it used, doctor? So this is a very old implant. Sir. Nowadays, we are not using this. So that uh, the plate, uh, the with the holes is there. That is a plate that is called as a McLaughlin plate, and the other one would be a nail. The ro uh, long rod is there. That is called as Smith Peterson nail. Okay. This is mostly okay. used in the uh, either the neck of femur fractures or the the intertrochanteric fractures we can use this so Three here the, the plate is yes sir, the, the mclaughlin plate is attached to the shaft and the nail is passed through the neck neck so that the fracture is uh, kept kept in a position today it is not that commonly used doctor no it is not the not uh, today uh, the the advancement of this is the uh, called as dynamic hip screw i see dhs so that is only most commonly used this and all very uh, much outdated Actually, I am now. I have not seen this. Okay, <laughs> I have never Great. seen this. <laughs> now, uh, now one question uh, uh, on a lighter side uh, uh, of the game, like uh, uh, you, when did you develop a love and passion for uh, orthopedic structure as an undergraduate or uh, uh, after joining post graduation? No, actually, from the beginning, I wanted to be an orthopedician because I have seen so many fields of medicine. From childhood, I would like to be a, a doctor. You see, in the movies, I always uh, I like to, uh, when a surgeon comes out of operation theater and he says operation success and patient is saved. Now all the attenders should be ah oh, wow wow. So I got uh, I want to be a surgeon. Then uh, as uh, and plus two on college first year, I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon because you know the recovery we can see in the patient immediately. So if the patient comes with the fracture, if I reduce the fracture, he'll be immediately happy. So if I fix the fracture immediately, he'll be able to move the limb. That is in the other departments of whatever this, it'll be a prolonged treatment. Uh, in general surgery, he'll be lying in bed for some time till they won't recover. That is here we operate hip, uh, we operate knee, whatever this, we make the patient walk, we make the patient function actively. So I can see the improvement, uh, no, in a very short term basis, and uh, it makes me very happy. 
so that's why i always like the field of orthopedics more than other uh, fields uh, was there any influential teacher during your mbbs days uh, who has put uh, or a senior or some role model who has uh, pushed you to love the uh, bones and orthopedics actually i i was i used to be a very good gymnast in the college i used to lift weights i go to some all fashion competitions i would i won some prizes also so my seniors they used to say that uh, for you also you are you are strong orthopedics is a very strong field so you have to be a uh, all this thing you need strength to reduce and all so uh, initially I, i i had a mind that i am going to be orthopedician but all the you know some influence everything came only towards the orthopedics and uh, so i just love orthopedics i just joined <laughs> that's what once upon a time um, obstetricians uh, used to be mostly men uh, you know you take mudaliyar shaw gynecology and all that datta obstetrics and all that so yeah, yeah. from the 1980s if you look at uh, especially tamil nadu they used to have all that uh, karnanadi kind of spectacles and yeah, the, very, the black yeah 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 <laughs> pretty personality uh, they used to tell in tamil just move and then pull out the baby you know so uh, yes. uh, later on the gynecology obstetrics became more women dominated but uh, even today some of the very confident obstetricians gynecologists turn out to be the men that's wonderful not really really wonderful so just a few more questions uh, another 5 minutes we will uh, uh, complete the session so okay. we will have many more sessions like this doctor and uh, it is like uh, uh, a great opportunity for us to learn the different conditions practically the person who practiced it you know um, i be i to i am a general medicine i used to teach all subjects Uh, mainly to help the students as a companion, as a classmate. But I always wanted uh, to the specialist, individual teachers to teach. Of course, general medicine is like you are a jack of all. You you know once you know anatomy, physiology, you can know anything fundamentally. So just few more questions. We'll finish. Uh, and tomorrow, once more, every day we have at ten p.m. uh so my request to the online classmates is uh, just for 999 rupees just for 999 rupees we offer 3 years of subscription and in this subscription you get almost 800 hours of video content totally 2000 hd videos you get powerpoint notes of around 35000 slides and you get 500 hours of interactive live discussion across the year and then 60 full scale grant tests every sunday for the neat pg along with discussion of all the 200 questions once more discussion also we are going to invite uh, toppers uh, uh two two or three toppers sit and uh, we finish discussion discussing all the 200 questions so that it will be interesting for all of you and uh, a 60000 mcq question bank both on the incas app and also on the online mbbs.com web both the access just for 999 rupees for 3 years that is almost for 1000 days so that we call it as 1 rupee per day should be your investment to become a postgraduate topper and when you become topper please don't forget the future generation of students please join on uh, the show and uh, i will be personally anchoring and uh, in 365 days in the year we are going to have around 500 uh, neat pg toppers um giving one hour of their time um in order to share a 50 mcq discussion uh, every day at 10 pm so that is our request to all of you and we have wonderful people like dr ganesh ram uh, and many more who will be joining so uh, doctor coming back what is this and where we use it so this is what i was saying that this is a dynamic hip screw this is the advancement of that smith peterson rod and the mclaughlin plate that is a old obsolete thing but this is the currently many are using this one this is the basic uh, in, implant for that intertrochanteric fractures also sometimes even the neck of femur the neck of femur fractures also some people are using but mostly it is a extra capsular fracture uh, implant this would be a. 
So there are parts would be a, a, a yeah, that's what. So there is a lag screw through the neck of femur and the plate will be in the side. So dynamic hip screw. So it will collapse the fracture fragments together so that it will get union. So that is the ideal uh, mechanism here. Wonderful, wonderful. So, what is this, and where we use it, doctor? So, these implants are used in the spine uh, fractures. It's called as a steffy plate. So, this is also now I have never seen it's a very old uh, implant, but only the examiners love all these old implant questions only now. <laughs> That's right. It's called a Student, steffy plate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is uh, one of the old uh, X-ray where we can see the steffy is variable screw placement. Whenever there is a thoracic lumbar fracture, and yes. what is this? And where do we use that? So this process is called as tension band wiring, or TBW. It is mostly used in a patella, olecranon, and medial malleolus. Great. So the steel wires, and uh, so that's great. Doctor. So thank you very much once more for uh, joining the session. And there are many more questions. We will have uh, episode two, episode three, episode four, multiple episodes following that whenever we, you get the time and uh, um, to spend one hour of your time, doctor. And uh, thank you all the online students for joining the session. And we will once more meet tomorrow at 10 p.m. Good night. Thank you. Good night, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.